So uh, my topic today when uh, the TEDx folks at Espeja asked me to speak uh, was on how people in our sector or the sector that I work in understand the impact and how do we achieve it and how do we differentiate uh, what we call real good versus what is often in the market as feel good. I'll explain a little bit uh, of what I mean by that. Uh, essentially, the sector that I work in is called the development sector. I mean, sometimes when I say I work in the development sector, people ask me, oh, what do you develop? Do you develop software or do you develop hardware or what is that you develop? In essence, development sector is a, a short form for human development sector, meaning anything to do with uh, reducing the vulnerabilities of people, reducing the difficulties of people, challenges. And a lot of the folks in the development sector, I mean, at least in countries like Indonesia or in India, most of the development work, quote unquote, is done by the government because it's in charge of the social welfare, is in charge of the social security, is in charge of reducing poverty and so on and so forth. But it's not exclusive of governments alone. A lot of UN agencies, NGOs, research institutions, think tanks, and also for-profit organizations work in this sector. Um, some of the areas of operation, as you can see uh, before, behind me, is uh, on agriculture, health, poverty, uh, conflict resolution, research, public policy, so on and so forth. Um, and also it's distinctly different sometimes from even though broadly the development sector could cover humanitarian relief, disaster, or uh, things like orphanages and refugee issues and so on and so forth. As a development professional, we tend to focus on long-term changes rather than short-term changes. That is distinct in charity. Charity means this Saturday you're feeling good. Maybe you made an extra bucks the last week and you want to share it with someone. You go to the nearby orphanage or you go to a, a refugee center or you go to a women's organization and you decide to paint the wall for them or you decide to buy a bunch of kids food with the extra money you made. These are what we call charities. The development in the, uh, in, in the sense is more long-term. We try to work on um, reducing what makes people poor in the first place and what makes people vulnerable to certain things. What I mean by vulnerable is Supposing it, me and someone else are walking on the road and somebody is trying to threaten us. Sometimes because I'm physically big, he or she may not try to harm me. But if physically, if I was weaker or based on my body language, people may try to threaten you. So in that situation, I'm physically vulnerable, at least in terms of appearance. And most often in our society, either as individuals or as a nation or as communities, we can be vulnerable to shocks that can affect us. Like a country can have a shock like a natural disaster, a village could have a shock like a lack of uh, rainfall which could cause problems in having agricultural produce being produced. Or individually, you could have a shock. Maybe you had a breakup with your girlfriend or somebody hurt you deeply or you failed in your ma uh, maths test or something like that. All these are shocks. But depending on how much you are built either emotionally, and most often it's emotionally or financially if you're a poor person, you are able to uh, be resilient to those shocks. Like if you have a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand rupiah and you need to survive that for the whole week, and somebody steals 10,000 from you, you still have 90,000 to keep you for the rest of the week. But imagine you only had 10,000 rupiah and somebody steals it. You are going to be hungry throughout that week. And that's what happens to a lot of us in our communities that things when they are not prepared for happens. And that is why it's called a shock. And most of the organizations which work to prevent these kind of shocks are called development agencies or development organizations. Some of them are the UN and NGOs and governments and so on and so forth. And uh, my organization, Dev Cafe, is one of them. Um, the context in which we work 
as opposed to regular situations is not like tomorrow I get up and I say I want to go to Pacific Place Mall. I want to hang out with some friends. I have the liberty or privilege to think like that. But in the context in which we work, people are not often being able to make that choice. It's a privilege to even get up on a Sunday to say, I want to do this or that. I want to have coffee rather than tea. But a lot of folks right now while we speak are in a position where they don't know whether they can have the next meal or under distress. You probably watch news. You see people are in war and crime and terrorism affected or hurricane and situations where people don't know if they can even wake up the next day. And especially when they are vulnerable, meaning all they have is 10,000 rupiah, in, to, if you look at that metaphor, they are going to find it very hard to survive the next day. And that is the context under which we work. And many times, like many kids are here from Espeha School, it is a well-known school, and you're able to voice your opinion because structurally you are empowered to speak out or talk to you or your parents will speak for you or you, you have the resources to make your voice heard. But many times, those of us in our communities, even the hidden voices, they are unable to voice the concerns. And development professionals try through research and evaluation and proper study to talk about what they are facing, both at the national, regional, and also community level. Um, some of the terms that we use in describing what makes a person vulnerable is if you've seen circus, I don't know if many of the circuses are available. At least when I was a kid, we used to have these circuses. Circus is this, you know, like a fun thing where there's a clown or there are animals and the people do tricks. And one of the tricks in that is where there's a tightrope walking person. Uh, they walk on the, you know, on a very high tightrope and they try to cross without uh, either sometimes with a long stick or sometimes just by themselves. And if they're really daredevils, they won't have a safety net to fall on. But most often, they used to have a safety net that even though they're experts in walking this tightrope, uh, because y you might slip and fall, you can fall on that. But that, that metaphor is what we use when we work with communities. That people, when they are coming through disaster, imagine there's a household, there's only one farmer or one person working in the household and the wife is bedridden or sick, and they have like three kids, and this one person is trying to feed their families. And that person dies or has an illness. Then in case they had some savings, or they have a community support, or some sort of, uh, some, some sort of a financial contribution that they can rely on, that is the safety net when someone falls sick, or the main person who earns money falls sick. But in most cases, they work on a day-to-day -day basis, foot to mouth, what we call. You work today, you're able to feed. You don't have work, you're unable to feed your children. And imagine you fall sick or wor worse still, you have an accident and pass away or sometimes, because most of them work in risky situations, uh, their, their main breadwinner dies. That is where there is no safety net and they get more and more, more and more into poverty. For people like that, we can't do charity. Maybe you can feed them lunch or meet the, give them one-off one, one things. But to understand why people fall into situations of lack of safety nets or what makes people vulnerable, you need to do a long-term study to see what is the issues that is why people in a particular region or a particular country are more prone to falling into disaster or more prone to falling into poverty. So development work can be studying about an individual village, individual community, or a nation. And sometimes it can be about just the climate also. Because sometimes what pushes people into poverty is the, is the climate in which you live. I mean, I used to work a lot in a region called semi-arid tropics. The world has 20 agroecological zones. I think uh, we are, I'm sweating because we are in a humid zone. But semi-arid tropics is a, is a zone where rainfall is erratic. All of you eat food, right? Is there anyone who doesn't eat food? So food comes from agriculture. And agriculture, a lot depends on the climate in which you live. So you, you eat rice because rice is grown where there is water. But if you live in semi-arid tropics, you depend on different kinds of foods. Your color, your appearance, your build, everything depends on your agroecosystem. But in some agroecosystem, by nature, they have very poor safety nets. 
or they have very poor climatic conditions. So development professionals also assess that when they give long-term solutions to these kind of development issues. And also vulnerabilities can be individualistic as well. I mean, as I told you, development work is not just at the national level or village level. It can be geographical, but it can be for one person also. I put three, sh three short names there, A, B, K, S, R, W. It actually stands for Anthony Boudoin, Kate Spade, and Robin Williams. All very successful people in the prime of their career. From the outside world, it looks like they are, are having the time of their lives. I mean, they have wealth, fame, maybe access to things that we all crave for, you know, success. But they all kill themselves. Why? Because they are not resilient to shocks, or they're not built to be resilient. So vulnerabilities is not often a, a thing of the poor, or thing of the climatically, uh, uh, I mean, in, or difficult climate zones, but also to individuals who are seemingly successful in our eyes, because they are individually vulnerable, individually not resilient to shocks. In individual cases, I'm not gonna examine why, despite the so-called successes, uh, Folks like that who are so on the prime of the career commit suicide or uh, unable to cope with the challenges in their lives. I'm not going into that, but it gives a little bit of flow into what I mean by feel good versus real good. So when you do charity on a weekend, sometimes you do feel good. I'm not saying you should not do charity. Please go ahead and do charity. But development work is long term, and it does not often feel good. And what I have learned at least in the last 20 years is when you do long-term interventions, it's, it doesn't give you instant gratification. And sometimes you're not even there in the picture. And that's something we will examine a little bit. When we do evaluation of our work, when, uh, either, either at the national level or regional level, or sometimes multiple countries, or in individual levels, I'm also a development evaluator. So we, we evaluate whether the intervention we did through systematic study and research was successful in terms of whether it was relevant. Let's say I'm studying poverty issues in Indonesia. But whether my situation or whether my intervention was relevant to Indonesia, was it efficient, and was it effective? And then, then we can measure how it was impactful. And more than just creating an impact, we want to see whether it's sustainable. Even after we have done the intervention, are people able to hold on to that particular situation themselves and become resilient? So what, what is impact? You hear, I mean, uh, in the board, there's outside there, SPH impact, is, and we all see. But what is this impact? Is it number of links clicked? Some of the brightest minds that I've been speaking to in the last weeks, last two weeks, uh, I mean, I was in the US, and, and even last week, I was interacting with a lot of these bright data scientists. They're these brilliant guys who can analyze great things in seconds but they use their brains only to make sure my friend here clicks more ads. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're using their data science skills to reduce to our jobs to just clicking on links and ads, even though they could be using the same skills for so much more than making a few people or even millions of people click on ads. So our lives, our impact, or our skill sets towards creating and achieving impacts have become just volumes. You know, number of people, number of shares, number of items you sell, the number, the quality is disappearing and quantity is taking precedence in our lives in one way or the other. But is it really real good? Does it last? I mean, we just spoke about Anthony Bourdain and uh, Kate Spade. They sell so much products and televisions uh, and also Kate Spade. There is one Kate Spade right here in this mall. I mean, very successful. They must be selling a lot of stuff. But is it really lasting real good that can help you make impacts? I'm not saying you shouldn't share in Instagram or Facebook. I am not going to say, oh, this generation or things like that. I'm sure you're all very smart. And uh, this is not uh, a moral lecture for you. But if you're really wanting to understand what is creating real impacts, you need to understand the difference between what is feel good and what is real good. That's why I mentioned it. So what is this feel-good interventions? Hashtag. There's a disaster happening in, uh, where was that recently? Lombok, and then Bali, and then Kerala in India. You want to say, I stand with Kerala, hashtag. 
you are all dying there but don't forget about me don't forget about me i am standing with you i mean the hashtag interventions have become more important because you want to feel good that you are doing something even though you're doing nothing you're just clicking a few <laughs> mouse clicks on your facebook so somebody is dying in a hurricane there but don't forget about me you know i i am so important that's what i mean by hashtag interventions but does it doesn't mean you should not raise awareness through social media you should but also get your butt out there and go <laughs> go out and do something which you can you don't have to be a development professional to make an impact you don't have to be a researcher or a government official in your own spheres in your own strengths whether you're it whether you're social scientist whether you're a mathematician or physician all of these skills can be used to create sustainable impact how can you do that is by studying and understanding the problem first rather than just going with oh i can do this i want to do this and that takes time i call this dale carnegie solutions in some cases do you know dale carnegie have you heard is a very popular tedx speaker ted speaker any bookstore you'll find dale carnegie's positive attitude books did you know how he died he committed suicide you don't know <laughs> go check up google <laughs> dale carnegie talked about positive living all his life but he couldn't apply it in his own life because there's a difference between feeling good and real good these kind of instant gratifying interventions are only temporary long term study another thing i wanted to say is this there's a if you go to ubud you have all these yogis i have a retreat program in bali for development professionals because our job can be mentally taxing because we deal day in out day out with people with real issues so it can really tax you and burn you out so we have a retreat program and to use in that retreat program i was interviewing a lot of this yogis and spiritual healers in ubud this is one of the most messed up people i have met in my life <laughs> really i am not joking i am not saying there are no good people in ubud or their healers and yogis are all fake i'm not here to say that but some of the people i interviewed cannot handle themselves you know there's a big hole in you you so you're trying to see holes in others and trying to fix so you should be cautious in understanding when you when you go for this instant solutions to problems i mean whether it's at an individual level or community level or even at a national level or in bodybuilding when i started i mean now i you can see i'm fat building but long time ago <laughs> long time ago i used to be one and at that time i i realized something long time ago in bodybuilding there's three things size shape and symmetry so all of us are either ectomorphic or endomorphic and the aim in bodybuilding is to become mesomorphic where you have all these three aligned perfectly but our guys when used to work out in india we used to call them chicken bodybuilders they just want a big chest and arms and the legs will be like chickens <laughs> because you you're only building your mind you lift so heavy which your muscle cannot take and you think you are doing bodybuilding so most often feel good interventions are only satisfying your mind it's not really good for your body or for the people that you work with whether it's yourself or your parents or your communities and so on and so forth or for example clinical depression is a serious problem which requires clinical requirement but there's a dude called sadguru who is very popular i'm sure i'll get in trouble if you put this in youtube but i don't care but he is a very popular indian guru who always talks about oh you can think yourself out of clinical depression which is a false because you can't think yourself out of these things you have to systematically approach clinical depression as if it's an acidity or a headache or you know you don't think yourself out of a headache no you you maybe you can but at least normal people like us we have to take a tablet or take rest or something that is an intervention which is systematically given and another one this guy there baruk spinoza maybe i again get in trouble for introducing him he is a 16th century philosopher who said that uh, if you really want to be christian or if you really want to be a religious person close to god you should reflect in your action your prayer is only for you god is going to bless you irrespective of whether you pray to him or not your job in this earth is to be of use to your fellow human being in any way you can you be an artist or something but his particular philosophy was not popular because church at those days the dark ages were really had both temporal and spiritual power so they didn't quite uh, follow him but if you see any of these miracle crusades that happen 
where people say, God is going to do a miracle in your life. If they, that feels good, right? Because it's about you again. Like I stand with Kerala. Kerala is in floods or Lombok is in floods. It doesn't matter. But you are there. You are standing with them in hashtag. So that's why he doesn't become popular. But people who push these snake oils. I, do you know snake oils? You've heard of snake oils? In villages in India, they used to sell snake oil as a solution for all problems. <laughs> Even though snakes don't produce oils. <laughs> they only produce venom. But nevertheless, they, they, they sell it as you take this medicine, you will have a, you know, strong strength and all this they will sell. But this is what, you know, we, we tend to think the God of infinity, the God who created heaven and earth, is thinking about what you are doing in the bathroom. So you feel so good about it. You know, people push this and that becomes popular. But Spinoza is thinking about, no, you have to get up and do something, becomes less relevant. So there's so much connection in spirituality and philosophy in what we do in development. Because long-term, real good interventions cannot be so feeling good all the time. Many times I advise governments through research we do for two years, three years, and then the whole country's policy changes. But no one knows who Val Gandhi is. Okay, you guys know because he's there, but at least the people in which we work for, we don't know because it happens in the background. And doing real good, impactful work as young people requires a certain level of maturity that is not constantly making things about you. I mean, you won't get likes and shares and follows, but you will create impact. Like I said in the beginning, this is all, I am not here to lecture you on whether you should be on Instagram or Facebook. Please, you are young kids, you should do all that fun part. But if you want to create an impactful, meaningful, sustainable uh, life for others and for yourself, that requires a little bit about, I mean, a lot less about you. But it's about understanding what goes around you. And it doesn't have to be something you have to specifically do. Whatever you're good at, you can still contribute to society in the most powerful way you can. I know many of you, like development sector job is not very sought after and not many people know about it. I mean, probably it's the same in Indonesia. In India, if you're either a doctor or an engineer, everything else, you're a failure in life. <laughs> uh, probably it's the same because we are all Asians, so we are kind of cousins. But, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's what happens. But they, they, they think there is no other work. But I mean, I used to be in IT and then moved to development. It has been one of the most fulfilling and continued to learning experiences of, uh, of my life. So that's why, uh, that's why I want to make sure how do you identify real good versus real impact. If you want to create impact in life, first of all, understand the problem. Study it. One thing that I learned from my mentors, a lot of them were simple people. You won't find them in public venue is, we live in an age of information. Anything, please Google this, Google that. But you know one thing you cannot Google no matter what we try? It's wisdom. You can Google information as much as you like. I can, I can find out where you're from, what you're doing. Next second I can find out who is the speaker, everything. But wisdom comes from experience. Wisdom comes from books. I'm not talking about Harry Potter, and you can read Harry Potter, fine. But you know this philosophy and ancient, I mean, I think SPH school, you have really good books. These things you can't Google. So that's why I listen to people who've been through situations before you and learn. And one of the ways you can open your mind to wisdom is being humble to understand what happens and what does not happen. So. Uh, Please use social media to change, impact, create, and I'm not saying from tomorrow throw away your Instagram account, not at all. But remember, when you want to create uh, impactful, meaningful life for yourself and in your communities, in whatever way you can, it's beyond just numbers, beyond just volume. It's quality. It's understanding things that matter are not always feeling good. You won't even feel something when you do. You, you don't feel like you've accomplished. But really great people don't constantly, at least if you see historically, I can name a number of people, they are not craving for attention. They are not craving for laurels. They are not, you know, some interviews, people sometimes ask you, what are you most proud of? If you are good at something, you don't need to be proud of it. It should be an effortless thing for you. you sh it should be a piece of cake. Are you the best physicist? Are you the best scientist? Why do I need an award? My work is my reward. My work is my award. 
Why should I be proud of it? I'm God created me, or universe created me. Whatever you believe in, it's individual. But what you achieve itself is your reward. But if you're constantly looking for that likes and shares and awards, you end up, unfortunately, like some of those folks I mentioned, where your individual resilience is dependent on those shares and likes, and then you cannot create meaningful impact when you yourself are unable to cope with the situations that are thrown before you in life. For us in development sector, we try to understand how to bridge people's safety nets, how to build, what are the missing safety nets. If it's a poor farmer's household, or if it's a nation that lacks infrastructure in IT or agriculture or refugee issues, and how do we reduce vulnerabilities, like climate change? How can we use IoT sensors, smart sensors? How can we use uh, mobile phones to inform people about rainfall coming up so people can be prepared, or earthquake coming up and people can be prepared? And how do we build resilience? These are key things. Resilience is after you've taught people to manage their own livelihoods, either as an individual or a nation, how do they continue to do that? These things will lead to sustainable impact. And that is, excuse me, that is key to creating lasting impacts. And that is what I wanted to